thank you. Daniel, thank you for playing the keyboard for us. This morning, uh, we're going to, uh, if you've been following along each week, uh, we've been in the book of Philippians, and we finished that last week. And so, today, I'm going to be sharing with you from 1 Corinthians, and we're going to be in the first chapter. Let's just have a word of prayer. Father, I just pray that as we come to the word, that you will anoint us, that you will speak to our hearts, that you will give us understanding, and that you will bless us with us, Lord. Father, we know that when we open the word and read and speak and share, you're speaking to us. And we are here listening this morning. We give you honor and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, in this uh, chapter of um, 1 Corinthians, chapter 1, again, it is a letter that Paul is writing to one of the churches. This is the church of Corinth. And um, as you know, there are two letters to Corinthians, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians. This is the first one. And he uh, um, starts off uh, greeting them, and we're going to pick it up in chapter 1 uh, in verse 26 and read through verse 31. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, beginning with verse 26. I like this first line. And it's so important to all of us. He says, for consider your calling, brethren. You know, uh, I've been in the ministry for over 40 years. I know none of you thought I was ever that old. <laughs> but um, I have been, and it was always impressed upon me at my ordination by the pastors I served with in the churches that I served. It was always this thing that was on me. Consider your calling and consider who you are. And you know what? That's, just, that's not just for ministers. That's for every believer. Amen. That we remember who we are because God chose us. And to remember our calling to be prayer warriors and men and women of God. And I just love this where he starts it here. For consider your calling, that you were not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things which are strong. And the base things of the world and the despised, God has chosen the things that are not that he might nullify the things that are, that no man should boast before God. You know, um, I think back uh, in my childhood and when I was a teenager and a young man growing up, and you know, everybody, I suppose, um, goes through periods of time where they, where they think, man, you know, I, man, I really got my life together. Man, I'm going to do great things in this life, and I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do that. And the older I got, the more I realized I didn't know. And the older I got, the more I realized what a fool I am. You know, that, that I would even think that I could do anything on my own. And I've come to the places I know most of you have too. That we don't do anything unless we ask God to lead us and guide us and direct us and to help us. Um, I have regular attacks from Satan because uh, Satan doesn't want ministers to preach and Satan doesn't want ministers to preach the word and teach the word and every every morning when I come and I'm on my way or I, I, I was going to say every Sunday when I come but we do this this is on Saturday that's a good thing it's a Sabbath right so we're on the Sabbath today but on my, on my drive in, it takes me about an hour to drive here. Satan is on my back constantly. 
And I have to, I'm, I'm, I'm coming in praying and I'm thinking, God, please guard my heart. Lord, please guard my mind. Lord, please remember who I am. That you chose me for something specific and, and I'm trusting you. It's all about you, Lord. And, and you know, I don't know if you go through these kind of battles or not, but I go Amen. through these things all the time. And I think that God is trying so desperately to encourage us and to help us. But Satan is doing everything he can to tear down the church. He's, he's even managed to close the doors. It's been closed, what now? Um, May, June, July, August, we're into September. We're into five months of the church's doors being closed. That's unbelievable. Amen. That's never happened in the history of the United States. Amen. But God is still on his throne. Amen. And that has not changed. And there's going to be a reckoning coming. And I'm afraid it's going to be coming soon. He goes on in verse 30. But by his doing, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, and righteousness, and sanctification, and redemption, that just as it is written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. We're going to be focusing this morning mostly on verse 30. But by his doing, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. I'm constantly intrigued and I'm certain that I've mentioned this many times and probably bored you with it. But I have never gotten over the fact that God chose me. And, and every Christian, every believer has been chosen of God. God reached down and plucked you out of the life you were headed for and out of the life I was headed for and chose us for greater and better things to serve our Lord Jesus Christ. And the, the word says, and I love the way John puts it here, and if you don't have this verse underlined in your Bible, it needs to be. John 15, 16, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit, and that your fruit should remain, so that whatever you ask in the Father in my name, he may give it to you. God chose us. What a wonderful privilege to be chosen of God. Not because anybody's necessarily a prophet, or a judge, or an important person necessarily, but he chose us because he loves us, and he wants to bless us. And um, that has always been overwhelming to me. Last week, if you recall, we were talking about how the disciples were chosen and literally how they became miracle workers. Remember about how Jesus was walking along and he saw the fishermen. He said, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. And they kind of looked around and they said, oh, well, okay, and dropped their nets and followed him. Most of them did not have a formal education. And they were just guys off the street. And we remember we talked about how um, Jesus discipled them and how they learned and how they grew. And, and God, uh, Jesus sent them out two by two and they'd go out and they'd come back. And they were amazed that, that they were able to cast out demons and heal the sick. They were amazed. These common, everyday men. Well, there's something here in all of that too. Because in these first few verses that we read, we we realize that God is not out looking for people that have a lot of talent and that have a lot of smarts and a great education and all this. God looks at our hearts and he looks at us and says, here is somebody who will follow me and love me and obey me. And these, the, the same thing happened in the New Testament when Jesus was going from place to place. Like, for example, we were talking about the disciples last week. He chose Peter. Peter was probably the, the, the loudest and, and, and the most arrogant of all the disciples. I think he probably was the biggest. And if you recall, he's even the one that when they came to take Jesus, he drew out a sword. Now, what was he doing with a sword? But he pulls out a sword and cuts the serpent's ear off. And Jesus, of course, takes the ear and puts it back on, and it's healed. 
Peter wasn't chosen for his uh, smooth talking and his way with people. Amen. But God chose him. Matthew was one of the most hated of all the men of the disciples because he was what they called a publican. He was a tax collector. They hated tax collectors. Why would Jesus choose a tax collector? Because he looked in and he saw Matthew's heart. Amen. And he, he said, here's a man who will follow me. And he did. Remember the little boy that showed up for the picnic? 5,000 people sitting on the hillside. This little boy was, was barely old enough to find his way around. And he became the center of attraction. Why? Because he had five loaves and two fishes. That's like about um, two full hot dogs. And, and he just came up and said, I'm willing to give my lunch to feed these people. And the, the disciples kind of look at each other and say, right, Peter, Pop, Peter elbows John and says, yeah, we're all going to eat on this. You know? Jesus took it and what did he do? He oh. took this little boy's willingness to share and blessed it and fed 5,000 people plus and went out and filled 12 baskets full of leftovers. Oh man, is that amazing? That is, and then there's the uh, woman, Mary Magdalene. God chose her to be the one that found the empty tomb. She loved Jesus so much and she was going there to just cry. And I could just see her on her way and looking for a place to just throw herself on the ground and weep before the tomb where her Lord was laid and suddenly she realized, whoa, there, there's no rock in front of the hole. And she looked in and it wasn't there. She, God chose her to be the one that discovered that Jesus had indeed done what he said he would do and, and be risen from the grave. Remember the woman at the well? She, she probably is described best as a, a local prostitute of that town, of the city of Sychar. And Jesus was waiting at the well and she came up and she had a bucket and he says, uh, uh, woman, could you give me a drink, please, you know? Which was very customary. Any man could ask a woman that came to the well to give him a drink. That was the custom of the land. And, um, but she says to him, remember, how is it that you, a Hebrew, would talk to a Samaritan woman and even talk to me? Nobody, no Jew even wants to talk to me. And he began to talk with her because he saw her heart. And he soon saw through all the sin in her life. And he saw that she had a heart to serve God. And when he was done with her talking that day, she ran back into the city and brought everybody out of the city out to hear Jesus. And they had a revival on the, in, in the gates of Sychar. And his disciples came back from looking for food. And they're looking around and saying, what in the world is going on here? You know, God chooses the ordinary people of the world and confronts them and says, will you... Choose what I offer in Jesus' name to you and serve me. And he chooses us because he sees something in us that no one else can see. Amen. And besides that, he chooses to love us unconditionally. That doesn't mean, of course, that the minute we meet, we meet Jesus, we never sin again. In fact, sometimes it even gets worse because Satan's on our back trying to discourage us. But you see where all of this is going. The idea is that God did not come along and choose the, the smart or the educated or the talented or, or the ones that seem to be the up and coming uh, yuppies of the day. He just chose the people that were just common day, everyday people. There were a few that he chose. Paul, for example, was a scholar. He's one of the few educated men that Jesus called. But nonetheless, you see what's happening here. Now, in all of this, with this as sort of a backdrop, verse 30 says, And by his doing, you are in Christ Jesus. 
So when we are chosen of God, we come to God by choosing Jesus. Loving God is not enough. Obeying God is not enough. We have to believe and repent of our sins and embrace Jesus as our Lord and Savior. And then God is able to do something in our lives. In Romans chapter 11, verse 33, he begins to talk about wisdom. Because wisdom is the first thing that, that uh, Paul writes here. He be, who became to us wisdom from God. Jesus became our wisdom. And in Romans, he writes, and Paul is writing in Romans too. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and unfathomable his ways. Uh, if you sit down and try to understand God and wonder what he's doing and where he's going and what it's all about, you, there's no way. You just have to step quietly by and be obedient and do what God shows you to do and what God tells you today. But Ephesians says in chapter 1, verse 13, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him. We need wisdom, but not as the world gives. You know, there's a lot of so-called quote unquote wisdom floating around in the world today. In fact, as you watch the news and listen to the reports on COVID-19, every so-called expert has a different view. Amen. They can't even get together on, on what's happening, what's going to happen, what this is all about, and they're, all, they're usually arguing about something because they only have the wisdom of the world. God gives us wisdom beyond that. He gives us the wisdom of God. And we wear it in our life as believers. And that's what being a Christian is all about. We don't have the things, or do we want the things of the world? We want the things that God gives to us. Now notice in verse 30, it says, um, Jesus Christ, who became to us wisdom from God. Jesus became our wisdom. But look what it says next. And next, and righteousness. Righteousness. Romans chapter 6, verse 18 says, And having been set free from sin, you have become slaves of righteousness. The believer, even though we know we make mistakes, and even though we say things maybe we shouldn't say, we are slaves to wanting to be the way God wants us to be. I want more than anything else in my life to be the man God called me to be. Amen. And I know you, as believers, you want to be the person that God has caused you to be. Because we want to embrace the righteousness that is made available to us through Christ Jesus. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 6. And by the way, keep in mind, this is found in Matthew, the tax collector. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Matthew had a thirst for righteousness. He was doing the job as tax collector, but God saw in his heart he had a thirst for righteousness. And he wanted to be a man of God. And he chose to follow Jesus when Jesus asked righteousness. So in verse 30 it says, uh, but, but by his doing you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God and righteousness. And next it says, and sanctification. Sanctification is one of the hardest things to understand. The average person, uh, if you ask them, what does sanctification mean? Well, basically and essentially, it means holiness. But when we start thinking, or at least let me speak for myself, when I think of myself as being holy, I really struggled with that. But God has put the sanctification, his sanctification upon me and upon you and upon every believer to walk in the holiness of God. But I'll tell you what, folks, in my everyday life, there are times that I don't feel very holy. 
And I'm sure there are times I don't sound very holy. And there are probably times I don't look very holy, if I ever have at all. But do you see what I'm talking about? God puts some things on us that we don't even fully understand ourselves. I don't even understand holiness from the standpoint of I know God is holy. I know Jesus is holy. I know that there's holy things going on in heaven and, and we can talk about it. But to say that I understand it, I don't fully understand it. The best example that I've ever heard of holiness and becoming holy, and I think I've given this illustration before, and you can take a little nap if you've heard it before. But it was when they were building the tabernacle and the temple, and they were making the candelabra and the plates and this, all of the artifact things that they used for sacrifices and for worship. And there was blacksmith and artisans that were pounding these pieces of metal of gold and silver and brass and bronze out in the fire and polishing them. I mean, they'd even drop them on the floor. They'd pick them up. But finally, the day came, and they were done. And these items were all finished and ready to be set in the tabernacle. Do you think those guys walked in there with their dirty hands and their nasty aprons and their tools? No. They were given to the high priest, and the high priest took them in and set them out. And then they had a special service to dedicate and anoint these objects as holy before God. Now, do you think after that was done that one of those blacksmiths could come back in there and say, oh, I want to take this back and polish it a little bit more? No, he was done with it. Now it had been anointed and blessed and sanctified by God. That's the way we are. Amen. God takes us in all kinds of situations. And we can talk to everybody that's listening today and we can find all kinds of situations that they were in when God approached them and when they heard the voice of Jesus and when they realized they were being chosen and had the opportunity to receive Christ. We would find all kinds of situations that they had been in, places they had been in, and, and things they had done. And now... You receive Christ, and you are anointed. And by the touch of God, by his decree, you are made holy, holy. And we sing holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. Now, you may not feel very holy. You might not look very holy. But in your heart, the holiness of God reigns, and God looks down upon it. And when he sees you, he sees Jesus. And that's where all of this is going. Um, notice uh, uh, in verse, uh, in, in Acts chapter 20, verse 32, notice it says, And now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. An inheritance comes from God by being sanctified. We have a special inheritance. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 5 says, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely. I like this part because it breaks it down. And may your spirit and your soul and your body be preserved complete without blame at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Sanctification is holiness that is continually working in our lives. The last thing he mentions here in verse 30 is redemption. Redemption. Christ, it says in Galatians, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us as it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. And of course, the tree represents the cross that Jesus died on. It was considered a curse to be sentenced to die on a cross in those days. And he stepped in and gently moved us back and climbed on the cross in our behalf because he didn't want us to have to die for our sin. He redeemed us in that way. Ephesians says in chapter 4, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by which you were sealed for the day of redemption. Now, 
we have experienced redemption today in the sense that Jesus has redeemed us from our sin. Um, sometimes people don't fully understand what it means to be redeemed, but the best example I know of is, is when you take something to a pawn shop and you give it to them and they give you money and when you can have the money plus the interest, you can come back and get it back. And they give you a ticket. It's your, it's your redeem your redeem ticket. You can't get that item back without that ticket. You got to come in and show it. I, here's my ticket. I got my money and the interest. I want my item back. I'm going to redeem it. And all of us have been redeemed from the pit of hell by the Lord Jesus Christ when he hung on the cross and died for our sin. And when we looked up and saw him and when we believed, we were redeemed. But I want you to notice it said in the first verse um, about redemption, where we were talking about the day of redemption, sealed for the day of redemption. We're going to talk about that day of redemption right now. And I want you to see that all these things are taking place at the same time. In verse 30, but by his doing you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness from God, sanctification from God and redemption. But there's going to come a day when all of this will come together and be real in our faces. And I want to read this in Revelation chapter 20. And I think we read this just a few um, weeks ago, but it needs to be read again. In chapter 20, verse 11 in Revelation, now you, re you recall, John was invited to come up to heaven and to look around and see what was coming, what was going on, and to write it down, and John does that. And here in, in Revelation chapter 20, beginning with verse 11, this is what he saw. And I saw a great white throne, and him who sat upon it, from whose presence earth and heaven fled away, and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, the great and the small, standing before the throne, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged from the things which were written in the books according to their deeds. Now, he was talking about the day of redemption. This is the day of, redeem of redemption they're talking about. It is the day when everything that Jesus has died for us for and everything that God has done uh, for us to be saved, we stand before the great white throne of judgment on that day because it says everyone will be there. But when he looks at you, he doesn't see the same thing everybody else has seen or what you were on earth, or what you did on earth, or what you said on earth. What he's going to see, he's going to look at you, and he's going to see Jesus. He's going to see the wisdom, and the righteousness, and the sanctification, or the holiness, and the redemption of Jesus. He's going to see Jesus because you are in Jesus, Jesus is in you, and all of your judgment has been set aside because Jesus already paid the price and he goes up, he goes on and says, And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead which were in them, and they were judged, every one of them, according to their deeds. And death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Folks, there's only one way for your name to get into the Lamb's book of life. When you receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And when you have a genuine conversion experience. When you have said to God, yes, I believe Jesus is your son. Yes, I believe you raised Jesus from the dead. Yes, I know he paid the price for my sin. And through him, I am forgiven. And I want your Holy Spirit to live in my life. And when you, when you presented yourself to God in that way, and when you are saved, your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Amen. Never to be erased. Never to be taken out. 
but they're for eternity. God has a plan for each one of us. Every plan is different. And those plans in our life will change throughout our life. Think back on your life and the different phases you've gone through in your life. Remember when you were a Christian, when you became a Christian? What, you, what was going on then? What has happened since then? Has your life changed any? Oh, yeah. I can't, even, I can't even count all the things that happened in my life since I became a Christian. Because I became a Christian when I was seven years old. Many of you became Christians when you were just children. That's not unusual in a Baptist church. Or in any church for that matter. But as we grow up, we do this, we do that. Um, and and I, had, I had fought surrendering to preach for years. For years. When I was 25 years old, I couldn't run anymore. And I had to say yes to Jesus. Because I knew it was the only thing left for me to do. And I thank God for that. And you, you have all faced similar things. And you know what I'm talking about. It's different for you. Some things are, you're able to share. Some things you're not able to share. I understand that. Amen. So let's all bow our heads this morning. And let's look to God. And first let's thank Him. Lord, we thank You this morning for Jesus. We pray in the name of Jesus. We embrace the things of Jesus. Thank you for your son, Jesus. Thank you for sending him to provide a means that we might be saved and forgiven and redeemed. And Lord, for these other things that you've provided us with, we pray that we will handle them properly and accurately. And Lord, if there's anybody right now watching this broadcast, that has never made a decision to receive Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, never embraced the truth of the gospel, I pray right now that they will say the words and say, yes, I receive Jesus as my Lord and Savior. Yes, I believe and ask for my sin to be forgiven. I repent and that you would give me your Holy Spirit to live within me and use me according to your will. Father, we love you so much. We know that you've got a plan for each one of us. And Lord, I, I want that plan to become real in each one of our lives this morning. And as we come to the close of this service, we're going to keep our eyes on Jesus. He's the same. You're all my soul my Jesus my Jesus he's the Savior of my soul he's the Savior of